music is an universal language. Angelique Kijo's latest album debuted at number one on the Billboard World Charts. Eve is inspired by the suffering she has seen on her continent in Darfur's refugee camps. I swear to God, I came back, could not sleep anymore. I have the voice of those women in my head. The Grammy award-winning artist is also dedicated to improving the lives of girls in Africa. The only thing that I know as an African person that can transform my continent is girls' education. Kijo campaigns for global freedom. Free Nelson Mandela was the right thing to do, and we did it as musicians. And speaks openly about what world power should do to help Africa. I think everybody owes something to the continent. Every single rich country owes us a lot. I spoke to Angelique Kijo in a recording studio in New York. You were well-educated as a child. How did your early education end up playing a role in your future success as a person? I think that when you are educated and you learn and you read a lot about not only your own culture, but other people's culture, you don't see differences. You see similarities and uniqueness of people. And I think also that education, what it does, that it gives you, it empower you in the way that you don't feel threatened when you go somewhere else. When you leave your comfort zone of home and you get somewhere, you feel absolutely empowered to take on any challenge that comes your way, to challenge any brain in front of you. Therefore, what you see is human beings first before you see the color. You, you hear people speak to you and you relate to what they say. So that formed your entire perspective of people. Yeah, it does, because that's what my father used to say to us home, read. Be curious. Your brain is your ultimate weapon. Be open to people. Don't judge people according to their skin color. That cannot define them. But there are men like my father in Africa. Not every man that have girls think that they are commodities. They think of them as human beings. Because my father always stood against any tradition, anyone that could come to his house and say it was worthless to send his three girls to school, he was like, who said, tell you that the brain of a girl is not as important as a man's brain? Are you saying that your father went against tradition by emphasizing education in his daughter's My lives? My father has stance against tradition that could have harmed us in any way, physically or our brain. Because he always said, the tradition that our, our ancestors set has to move according to the time that we live in. The society that we are in today is moving forward. So therefore, we can't go back. So how do we adjust those tradition to the reality of today? If you let anyone do wrong to your child, it doesn't matter the sex of that child. So you, then you're not doing your job as a parent. And there are other traditions that are harmful to girls. African nations still practice general mutilation, child marriage. How much are the problems we see persistent on that continent due to tradition, to customs? I think that, um, once again, all those issues that you raise will step by step disappear if we educated more people. I always say tradition exists, but that, the way we approach them, that's what makes the difference. If we in Africa, we Africans, with our leaders, we come to understand that investing in girls' education gonna raise our GDP, gonna diminish pandemics, sexual abuses, gonna make our economy rise up, rocket to the, to, the, to the sky. We put a law in place, which is absolutely compulsory for every child, boys or girls, to go to school till secondary education. The problem we are having today is that girls in some countries, in some traditions, are still seen as commodity and accessory. Therefore, they can be kidnapped, they can be married. The only thing that I know as an African person that can transform my continent is girls' education. Let's talk about your foundation, Batonga, which really deals with some of the practical issues as it pertains to girls' education, shoes, you know, bicycles, having them have a means to go to school. Um, 
are sometimes these problems more simple than we realize in the sense that like if we could just get enough girls shoes and bicycles to get to school and bathrooms when they get there many more girls will go to school it's true it's simple but complicated my take on this is you cannot help the African people by patronizing them and pitying them. Then your help becomes obsolete because no one wants to feel like that. The one thing that is have been lacking for years of people that come with goodwill to help the African people is the human and emotional connection to the people. Mm -hmm. If you see the people of Africa as statistics, as numbers, as inferior beings, that don't have the same right that you have in your country, then you can help us. I think a lot of people acknowledge today that educating girls and women does hold the key to solving so many of society's ail ailments around the world. Which brings me to the kidnapping of nearly 300 girls by Boko Haram in Nigeria. What are your thoughts on the rise of extremist groups like that? I think that the extremist group comes more from frustration not being able to participate in this world global economy. Religion is just an excuse for me. I don't believe that all of those extremists, they really believe in what they are saying regarding religion. It's just a matter of thinking that they are getting some power by, by horror, by kidnapping. And I think it questions also, for me, how we do business with one another. What do you mean? I think there's enough wealth for every single human being on this planet to live with dignity. I'm not saying that everybody's gonna be a billionaire or millionaire, but the problem we are having is how do we distribute the wealth of this planet? So you're saying if members of Boko Haram had jobs, they wouldn't need to kidnap schoolgirls? If they have perspective of future, you think they're gonna blow that away and get gone and kidnap girls? I don't think so. Most of them have never been to school, probably, and sit around and frustrated. I mean, that's the problem we have, and not only in Africa, but even in the rich countries today. So how do we, we have a society that is more balanced? This issue about schools and education mm -hmm. in Africa, mm -hmm. it's not just Nigeria. In the Central African Republic, two thirds of the schools have been closed for most of the year. What do you think the responsibility of great powers like the United States should be to places like that? I think that what we should do, the United States should do, is work with government in Africa, to help them build sustainable schools, to help them build their own economy. Because the problem in Africa is that after the colonization era, lots of countries never have had a chance to reach their full potential because the interest of the rich country always come before because of the richness of my continent. So in that way, do they have a responsibility? Do they owe something to the continent? I think everybody owes something to the continent. Every single rich country owe us a lot. So make that Starting argument. Starting with slavery. Some people here would say the United States government doesn't do enough to invest in education in this country. Make the argument, why should the United States do more to fortify education in Africa? Because the security of the United States is at stake as much as the security of the rich country and the democracy in the world. Because if we do not invest in the education in this country and in all those developing countries coming up, we're giving power to Al-Qaeda, all those extremist groups that are gonna use people that are struggling that are astray. If it becomes the responsibility of places like the United States and European countries to intervene in Africa, where is the agency among African leaders to do more? I'm not saying they have to intervene. What I'm saying is that they have to form a different relationship with the leaders in Africa. We owe our people to have plans, economical plan and social plan for our people. Not the American will come and do that, not the European will come and do that. But the thing is, if you have that plan in place, not, ne, no, no one else agenda should come before you, com you, you completed that plan.
But it over and over again, the system that is in place since the end of colonization does not allow us to move forward. That system has to be changed. Does it need to be changed by women? Absolutely. Yeah. Women are going to take over Africa. That's the threat of Boko Haram. That's what they see as a threat. Because if they let those girls go to school, they will lose their power because we will not allow it when we come to power for our children to be harmed by no one. We will have more guts to take the decision it demands for us to be a safe place, a safe country, and a safe continent that is thriving. Coming up on Talk to Al Jazeera, Angelique Kidjo talks about how power, politics, and music collide. I'm Stephanie Sai. We're speaking with Grammy Award-winning artist Angelique Kidjo on Talk to Al Jazeera. Many of the songs you write <laughs> are about the strength of women that inspired you in Africa. Absolutely. I've been raised by my mother, my two grandmothers that were widowed very early, and always said to us, my mom's mother always said to me and my sisters, your first husband is your job. <laughs> because you don't want to be in a relationship and you become a weight on the shoulder of your husband. And they always said, a man that say, I love you, that doesn't respect your brain and your body, and the person you are, run away. Because everybody can say, I love you. But what I love you mean is that they love the whole person that you are entirely, without trying to carve you to be somebody else. So I grew up with, like that. Your mother is actually the inspiration behind one of the singles on your new album, Absolutely. which, by the way, debuted at number one <laughs> on the Billboard World Music chart. Um, what inspired that album? What inspired that album is many trips throughout the years in Africa with Oxfam, with UNICEF, different organizations. In 2005, I took a trip to go to Chad at the refugee camp of the women from Darfur. And that has impacted my sleep till today. Your sleep? I swear to God, I came back, could not sleep anymore. I have the voice of those women in my head. What happened to them, I can't even start telling it here. But one thing they say before we left that keep me going is do not victimize us another time. We do not want to hear the word victim. All we want is to get out of this camp, go back home in safety and security, to raise our daughters and the little boy that we have still, and to keep on going on. We want to get on our life. And when I started writing this, this album, I started writing end of 2011, and the inspiration were the women, the strength and the beauty, the smile that you encounter in moment of despair. That smile just coming like a beam of light. I mean, and you go, well, behind pain, there is joy and love. But you're sometimes singing uh, about very difficult mm -hmm. topics. And I can't be sure because 95% of the lyrics are actually not yep. in English. Mm -hmm. Are these songs most people enjoy meant to be heard for both? Well, you know what? One, one thing that I know for sure is that the fact that people don't understand what I sing about doesn't make any difference in the message being delivered. Because music is an universal language. When you touch somebody's soul, you touch the person's soul. It doesn't matter what skin color the person has. And one thing that I learned from the traditional musician in my country is you have the gift of singing, of writing music. Doesn't matter how heavy, heavy the subject is, make the music danceable, enjoyable. Because if people, if people start feeling guilty, you turn them away. Because guilt don't make people move forward. Yeah. I understand that one of the first songs you wrote was a song about apartheid, and you describe it in your memoir as being a violent song that you're Daddy then told you to rewrite. When I was growing up, my father always used to say to us, there were no day where he won't repeat that. A human being is not a matter of color. Don't come back here and tell me you failed because you're black, because that's the first time I'm going to raise my hand on you. Never say that. So when I was nine, I discovered Jimi Hendrix with his afro. 
And for the first time I heard the word slave descendant. And I couldn't put it together because when my grandma started telling me about slavery, I'm like, ah, she's senile, she's losing it. It's like, it's impossible. And then I turned 15 and we smuggled to the TV of Nigeria and we saw, I saw and heard Winnie Mandela talking about Nelson Mandela and apartheid in South Africa. And I was sitting in the living room with my parents watching the news. And it's like a bomb would drop on me. Because suddenly, those words that my father used to say to us make no sense to me anymore. If we are the same human family, how can we do this to one another? I was so angry. So you wrote a song? I wrote a song called Azanakwe. The first draft was, if they don't like us, we kill them. <laughs> well, that is violence. You said it was violent, and that's violent. And my father said, no, not under my roof. I always told you that hate and violence are never going to have any place in this house. I understand how you feel, but you as an artist, you are the one that builds the bridge among people. You are the one that holds the key when every doors are closed for dialogue to become an, an option for everybody to sit at the same table and discuss. You will go back and write this song. I want this song not only to heal your pain, but to heal also your anger. Think about it. Where do you go from here with that anger? What is create? What positive thing that you're going to create? How do you feel right now? I say, I feel so bad, Dad. He said, okay, now go back and write it the way you feel. So that song has become an anthem of peace where I said, one day my dream is to see a world in which where there will be no more oppressors and no more oppressed people, that we all live free to achieve our dreams. My father said, that is acceptable. Do you, does that mean you never wrote an angry song again? Never. Do you ever listen to angry songs? I don't. I don't have time for that. I don't have space in my heart for that. I don't have time and I don't want, I don't have any desire to listen to somebody singing about hate of women, hate of this, hate. I know. I can't. You can be angry. I understand that. But if you, you're just negative about it, what good does it make? What does it change? You turn people away? And if you are in that bubble of hate, you don't see the light because you don't allow yourself to see the possibilities that are out there. And you are stuck in your own narrow world. And you're miserable. So music, hip hop, rap, whatever is out there, you can say what you have to say, but don't say it negatively. Open the door to possibilities. Say the thing. Tell the story as it is. Everybody has to tell their stories. Time magazine has called you Africa's premier diva. Bill Clinton said, quote, the only thing bigger than Angelique Kijo's voice is her heart. I want to ask you, how do you judge your own success? I don't think about it. Do you believe you're changing the world? Me alone, I can't. It's impossible. We together, we all that thing that is going to be better for this world for people to go to bed thinking I've done my share today and I'm happy with what I have. Someone say you've done more than your share. Probably. I don't think I've, I'm done yet. Because as long as they're going to be suffering on this planet, as long as they're going to be a child in this world that will go to bed with tears in his or her eyes because she doesn't have three meal a day or he doesn't have three meal a day, and her experiences are gone, nobody's there to care for him, and he has no access to school. The basic needs of children, our children, as long as those basic needs will be in jeopardy, I cannot go to bed and sleep quietly because we create the situation. No one should be sleeping quietly when the children that we bring to this world our wrongdoing is impacting the future. Coming up, Angelique Kidjo talks about why she hates the term world music. I'm Stephanie Sai. My guest, Grammy Award-winning musician Angelique Kidjo. You don't like the term world beat or world <laughs> music. Why is that? Well, 
I started with a conversation with Miriam Makeba a couple of years ago where she was furious. She said, what is it about the rest of the world that anything that comes from Africa have to be put in ghetto and put a label on? Why should they call the music from Africa world music? The music of Africa is the bedrock of hip hop, rock and roll, pop music, name it. But now they want to single it out because we African are doing it and the rest of the world can do anything with African beat. They don't call it world music. And she has a point there. So, and it, Mary McKeever was one of your early influences, absolutely. of course. And I, I crack up laughing. It was after a festival and at, at, at around midnight. I was on the couch. I laughed so hard my belly hurt. <laughs> one of your most famous concerts was in Zimbabwe several years ago when you railed against the leader Mugabe on stage. Um, I wonder, do you ever self-censor these days? You were kicked out of the country right after, I understand. No, I was not kicked out. You I was okay. supposed to leave the next day. I mean, when that concert comes in, I wanted to go to Zimbabwe so bad because I've never been to Zimbabwe before. And right before I left, I received an email from an activist from Zimbabwe telling me, Angelique, you can't come here because you were one of those voices that we can rely on to tell the truth out there. I never thought about it. Because me, for me, music has to go everywhere. Even in the condition where there's no freedom, we got to bring music there for people to be able to think and to get, get together and figure out how they're going to live together, right? So I reach out to UNICEF, I reach out to Amnesty International, all the organizations I work with, what is the situation out there? What am I going to do? So I went there and they tell me, well, you can make a statement on stage if you want. But that's what I did. And that's what you did. That's what I did. I said, we cannot blame everybody for our problems. That's exactly what I said. When we are the problem ourselves, when we, we hijacked our own population for one reason or the other, we can't just sit here and think that that's going to go away if we don't face the problem that we create to our people. So when you decide where to perform, and you've got several uh, concert dates coming up in the summer, uh, it, you really don't pay attention to the political situation because you want everyone to, to hear your music? Absolutely. Political, political situation is everywhere, good or bad. But if the public is there, I will play the show. You've had some really stellar uh, collaborations with artists quite varied, everyone from Santana to Josh Groban. Is there any collaboration that stands out in your mind as one that was particularly meaningful to you? All of them are meaningful because for me, we are all at the service of the song. And every artist that I work with, that's what we have done. That's why the songs are what they are, because we believe, all of us, of the universality of the music. We believe that music transforms lives of people. Me, deep, de definitely, I believe deep down my soul that without the gathering together that we all have in the 90s to free Nelson Mandela, South Africa would not be the place it is today. And that music have the power to get people together to believe in the goodness that we hold in us. Free Nelson Mandela was the right thing to do. And we did it as musicians. So music has so much power yeah. that when you have a, 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 a regime, a, polit a new politician that comes to a country that want to take over and doesn't want to follow democracy, the first thing they cut off is arts, is music. We have the Pussy Riot example. Yeah. So we have such a power that we don't even know we have the power. And just going back, because you actually experienced that firsthand um, when you were still in Benin before you left. In fact, isn't that what forced you to seek exile Absolutely. in France, is that Absolutely. you felt constrained. You felt that the communist mm -hmm. regime wanted you to be a mouthpiece for the government. I refused, because my father always used to say to us, especially to me as a singer, do not write music for any political party, because they come and they go. And once they're gone, you go with it. Write your music with your opinion. Be free writing your music. Don't be sold to somebody because therefore you don't become the voice of the people anymore. You become the voice of the power. And when that power shifts, you're off the window. The thing that I always say to people that live in the Western world that have had freedom for all those years is that you take it for granted and you sit quietly 
and you're comfortable in it. In a heartbeat, it can be taken away from you. And if it has never been taken away from you, you don't know how it feels. So freedom, when freedom is in danger anywhere, we all, as citizens of this world, should not be silent because it can come back and bite us. Angelique Kijo, thank you so much You're for welcome. talking to Al Jazeera.